Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Cogito Ergo Pod. I am your host Daniel and this episode and maybe the next we will be looking at one of the most important periods in European Christian history, the Protestant Reformation. I am splitting this bad boy over a couple of episodes because I do not think that there is anyone who wants to listen to a whole history of this event in one go. You need time for a bathroom break, to eat, maybe even to sleep. When it comes to the Protestant Reformation, or sometimes simply known as the Reformation, after all there aren't any more famous than that, I want to focus on the historical aspect of it. This is, after all, religious history at its finest, or perhaps its worst. We will look at what led to it, who the key players were, or more like the key player was, and the events that lasted over a hundred years in the 16th and 17th centuries. This episode will focus on the events surrounding why the Reformation happened, and a brief, in inverted commas, biography of the man credited with starting the whole party off, Martin Luther. I do not want to get bogged down in theological semantics, so I will try to keep it focused mostly on the historical aspect. To look properly at the theology would require a shed load more episodes, and for me to give up working and to research on it full time. So with that in mind, and with a deep breath, let us begin. First off, we have to begin by looking at the state of things pre-Reformation. It cannot be denied that Christianity was no stranger to change and challenges. The historical context behind the European Reformation has been building up for more than a century before Martin Luther came on the scene. John Wycliffe, 1328 to 1384, had questioned the, the privileged status of the clergy which had bolstered their powerful role in England and the luxury and pomp of local parishes and their ceremonies. According to tradition, Wycliffe and his associates were said to have completed a translation of the Bible direct from the Vulgate into Middle English, a version known simply as Wycliffe's Bible. However, any origin for the events of the early 16th century can be traced back to the beginning of the 1400s. At this time, there were two claimants to the papal throne, one in Rome, one in Avignon. This world of Pope and anti-Pope Catholic politics was nothing new, as you'll recall from a previous episode. However, it was resolved at the Council of Constance between 1414 and 1418. It was also at this time that the Hussite movement, which followed the teachings of reformer Jan Hus, was founded in what is now the Czech Republic. Jan Hus, lured by a letter of indemnity, was tried for heresy and put to death at the stake on the 6th of July 1415. The Hussites found the Hussite War from 1420 to 1434 for their religious and political cause, which unfortunately they lost. This Hussitism was a major basis for future possible Protestantism if there was ever any reason to oppose Catholic doctrine in the future. It was also around this time in Germany that a goldsmith by the name of Johannes Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press. This revolutionary new way of printing pages would enable up to 3,600 pages to be printed in one workday, compared to 40 pages by hand printing and only a few by hand copying. Information could be disseminated quickly and new ideas spread much faster than before. Now, there are three words I need to go over connected to both pre-Reformation and Reformation Europe before we go any further. The words purgatory, indulgences, and simony. Purgatory is, according to the belief of most Christian denominations, including the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches, an intermediate state after physical death for expeditory purification. As a noun, it appears perhaps only between 1160 and 1180 CE, giving rise to the idea of purgatory as a place. The Catholic Church found specific Old Testament support in afterlife purification in 2 Maccabees 12, 
part of the Catholic biblical canon, but regarded as apocryphal by Protestants. At the Second Council of Lyon in 1274, the Catholic Church defined for the first time its teachings on purgatory in two points. Number one, some souls are purified after death. Number two, such souls benefit from the prayers and pious duties that the living do for them. The prayers of the saints in heaven and the good deeds, works of mercy, prayers and indulgences of the living have a twofold effect. They help the souls in purgatory atone for their sins, and they make the soul's own prayers for the living effective. It is, in effect, a holding pen for souls not quite ready to get into heaven. But have no fear, the works of the living can help speed up the movement of the soul from purgatory to heaven. Here is where the indulgence comes into it all. In the teaching of the Catholic Church, an indulgence, the Latin indulgentia from indulgio, to permit, is a way to reduce the amount of punishment one has to undergo for sins. The recipient of an indulgence must perform an act to receive it. This is most often the saying, once or many times, of a specified prayer, but may also include a pilgrimage, the visiting of a particular place, such as a shrine, church or cemetery, or the performance of specific good works. By the late Middle Ages, indulgences were used to support charities for the public good, including hospitals. However, the abuse of indulgences, mainly through commercialization, had become a serious problem which the church recognized, but was unable to restrain effectively. Some commissaries sought to extract the maximum amount of money for each indulgence. Professional pardoners who were sent to collect arms for a specific project, practiced the unrestricted sale of indulgences. Many of these pardoners exceeded official church doctrine and promised rewards such as salvation from eternal damnation in return for money. With the permission of the church, indulgences also became a way for Catholic rulers to fund expensive projects, such as crusades and cathedrals, by keeping a magnificent portion of the money raised from indulgences in their lands. There was a tendency to forge documents declaring that indulgences had been granted. Indulgences grew to an extraordinary magnitude in terms of longevity and breadth of forgiveness. False documents were circulated with indulgences surpassing all bounds, indulgences of hundreds or even thousands of years. In 1392, more than a century before Martin Luther published the 95 Thesis, Pope Boniface IX wrote to the Bishop of Ferreira condemning the practice of certain members of religious orders who falsely claimed that they were authorised by the Pope to forgive all sorts of sins and obtained money from the simple-minded faithful by promising them perpetual happiness in this world and eternal glory in the next. The Butter Tower of Rouen Cathedral earned its nickname because the money to build it was raised by the sale of indulgences, allowing the use of butter during Lent. An engraving by Israel von Mechenen of the Mass of St. Gregory contained a bootlegged indulgence of 20,000 years. One of the copies of this plate was altered in a later state to increase it to 45,000 years. The indulgences applied each time a specified collection of prayers, in this case seven each of the Creed, Our Father and Hail Mary, were recited in front of the image. The image of the Mass of St. Gregory had been especially associated with large indulgences, such as the Jubilee year of 1350 in Rome, when it was at least widely believed that an indulgence of 14,000 years had been granted for praying in the presence of the Imago Piatis, Man of Sorrows, a popular pilgrimage destination in the Basilica of San Croce in Gerusalemme in Rome. Then we have the issue of simony. The act of selling church offices and rolls or sacred things. It is named after Simon Magus, someone who has been mentioned before, who is described in the Acts of the Apostles as having offered two disciples of Jesus payment in exchange for empowering him to impart the power of the Holy Spirit to anyone on whom he could place his hands. The term extends to other forms of trafficking for money in spiritual things. 
Although considered a serious offence against canon law, simony is thought to have become widespread in the Catholic Church during the 9th and 10th centuries. By the 11th century, it was the focus of a great deal of debate. Central to this debate was the validity of simoniacal orders, that is, whether a cleric who had obtained their office through simony was validly ordained. In 1494, mere decades before Martin Luther, a member of the Carmelite order, Adam of Genoa, was found murdered in his bed with twenty wounds after preaching against the practice of simony. The idea of purgatory, indulgences and simony were all bones of contentions for a great number of people. There was a very real internal conflict between adhering to the teachings of a Catholic Church which provided alms for the poor, orphanages and spiritual support for millions, and the moral conflicts which such dogmatic theology could have weighed on those who could see that there was something amiss. These are only some of the people and concepts which were influencing things at the turn of the century. All it needed was one, slightly neurotic, and famously constipated German, to tip Europe into total religious turmoil. Let's meet him now. Martin Luther, born 10th of November 1483, and died 18th of February 1546, was a German priest, theologian, author, hymn writer, professor, Augustinian friar, and general all-round troublemaker. Hans Luther, Martin's father, was ambitious for himself and his family and he was determined to see Martin, his eldest son, become a lawyer. He sent Martin to Latin schools in Mansfeld, then Magdeburg, in 1497, where he attended a school operated by a lay group called the Brethren of the Common Life, and Eisenach, in 1498. In accordance with his father's wishes, he enrolled in law, but dropped out almost immediately, believing that law represented uncertainty. Luther sought assurances about life and was drawn to theology and philosophy, expressing particular interest in Aristotle, William of Ockham, and Gabriel Beale. On the 2nd of July 1505, while Luther, only 21 years old, was returning to university on horseback after a trip home, a lightning bolt struck near him during a thunderstorm. Fearful that he would die during the thunderstorm, he prayed to Saint Anna. He asked her to beseech God to save him from the storm. If he, God, does save him, Luther would become a monk and serve him. Guess what? He survived and became a monk. He came to view his cry for help as a vow he could never break. He left university, sold his books, and entered St. Augustine's Monastery in Erfurt on the 17th of July 1505. Luther, during his time as a member of a religious order, became increasingly aware of the indulgences which were being collected by the Catholic Church. Not only does he know about them, he is increasingly opposed to them. Luther was also obsessed with his own immortal soul. He would spend so much time in confessional, confessing to every little thing he could, that eventually he was sent away to Wittenberg University. In 1516, Johann Tetzel, a Dominican friar, was sent to Germany by the Roman Catholic Church to sell indulgences to raise money in order to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Tetzel's experiences as a preacher of indulgences, especially between 1503 and 1510, led to his appointment as General Commissioner of Albrecht von Brandenburg, Archbishop of Mainz, who, deeply in debt to pay for a large accumulation of benefices, had to contribute the considerable sum of 10,000 ducats towards the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica. Albrecht obtained permission from Pope Leo X to conduct the sale of a special plenary indulgence, i.e. remission of temporal punishment of sin, half of the proceeds of which Albrecht was to claim to pay the fees of his benefices. On the 31st of October 1517, Luther wrote to his bishop, Albrecht, protesting against the sale of indulgences. He enclosed in his letter a copy of his Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, which came to be known as his 95 Thesis. 
Hans Hillebrand writes that Luther had no intention of confronting the church, but saw his disputation as a scholarly objection to church practices, and the tone of the writing is accordingly searching rather than doctrinary. Hillebrand writes that there is nevertheless an undercurrent of challenge in several of the thesis. According to one account, Luther nailed his thesis to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg on the 31st of October, 1517. Scholars Walter Kramer, Gotts Trenkler, Gerhard Ritter and Gerhard Kraus contend that the story of the posting on the door, although it has become one of the pillars of history, has found little foundation in truth. The story is based on comments made by Luther's collaborator, Philip Melechthon, though it is thought that he was not in Wittenberg at that time. From 1510 to 1520, Luther lectured on the Psalms, and on the books of Hebrews, Romans, and Galatians. As he studied these portions of the Bible, he came to view the use of terms such as penitence and righteousness by the Catholic Church in new ways. He became convinced that the Church was corrupt in its ways, and had lost sight of what he saw as several of the central truths of Christianity. The most important for Luther was the doctrine of justification, God's act of declaring a sinner righteous, by faith alone through God's grace. He began to teach that salvation or redemption is a gift of God's grace, attainable only through faith in Jesus as the Messiah. This one and firm rock, which we call the doctrine of justification, he writes, is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine, which comprehends the understanding of all godliness. Luther came to understand justification as entirely the work of God. This teaching by Luther was clearly expressed in his 1525 publication On the Bondage of the Will, which was written in response to On Free Will by Desiderius Erasmus, 1524. Luther based his position on predestination on St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, and we shall explain predestination at a later date against the teachings of his day that the righteous acts of believers are performed in cooperation with God, Luther wrote that Christians receive such righteousness entirely from outside themselves, that righteousness not only comes from Christ, but actually is the righteousness of Christ imputed to Christians, rather than infused into them through faith. Throughout his life, Luther maintained that it was not a false doctrine to believe that a Christian soul sleeps after it is separated from the body. This also led Luther to reject the idea of torments for the saints. He also rejected the experience of purgatory, which involved Christian souls undergoing penitential suffering after death. He affirmed the continuity of one's personal identity after death. Meanwhile, Archbishop Albrecht did not reply to Luther's letter containing the thesis. He had the thesis checked for heresy, and in December 1517 forwarded them to Rome. He needed the revenue from the indulgences to pay off a papal dispensation for his tenure of more than one bishopric. As Luther later notes, the Pope had a finger in the pie as well, because one half was to go to the building of St. Peter's Church in Rome. Over the next three years, the Pope deployed a series of papal theologians and envoys against Luther, which served only to harden the reformers' anti-papal theology. First, the Dominican theologian Sylvester Mazzolini drafted a heresy case against Luther, whom Leo then summoned to Rome. The elector Frederick of Saxony persuaded the Pope to have Luther examined at Augsburg, where the imperial diet was held. Over a three-day period in October 1518, Luther defended himself under questioning by papal legate Cardinal Cajetan. The Pope's right to issue indulgences was at the centre of the dispute between the two men. The hearings degenerated into a shouting match. More than writing his thesis, Luther's confrontation with the Church cast him as an enemy of the Pope. His holiness abuses scripture, retorted Luther. I deny that he is above scripture. Cajetan's original instructions had been to arrest Luther if he failed to recant, but the legate re desisted from doing so. With help from the Carmelite monk Christopher Langenmantel, Luther slipped out of the city at night, unbeknownst to Cajetan. In January 1519, at Altenburg in Saxony, 
the papal nuncio Karl von Miltzitz adopted a more conciliatory approach. Luther made certain concessions to the Saxon, who was a relative of the elector and promised to remain silent if his opponents did. The theologian Johann Eck, however, was determined to expose Luther's doctrines in the public forum. In June and July 1519, he staged a disputation with Luther's colleague, Andreas Karlstadt, at Leipzig, and invited Luther to speak. Luther's boldest assertion in the debate was that Matthew 16.18 did not confer on popes the exclusive right to interpret scripture, and that therefore neither popes nor church councils were infallible. For this, Eck branded Luther a new Jan Hus, referring to the Czech reformer and heretic burned at the stake in 1415. From that moment, he devoted himself to Luther's defeat. On the 15th of June, 1520, the Pope warned Luther with a papal bull, Exergius Domini, that he risked excommunication unless he recanted 41 sentences drawn from his writings, including the 95 Thesis, within 60 days. That autumn, Eck proclaimed the bull in Meisen and other towns. Von Miltitz attempted to broker a solution, but Luther who had sent a pope a copy of On the Freedom of a Christian in October, publicly set fire to the bull and decretals at Wittenberg on the 10th of December, 1520. As a consequence, Luther was excommunicated by Pope Leo X on the 3rd of January, 1521, in the bull Dicet Romanus Pontificem. The Catholic Church has never lifted the 1521 excommunication. The enforcement of the ban on the thesis fell to the secular authorities. On the 18th of January 1521, Luther appeared as ordered before the Diet of Worms. This was a general assembly of the estates of the Holy Roman Empire that took place in Worms, a town on the Rhine. It was conducted from the 28th of January to the 25th of May 1521, with Holy Roman Emperor Charles V presiding. Prince Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, obtained a safe conduct for Luther to and from the meeting. Johann Eck, speaking on behalf of the Empire as assistant of the Archbishop of Trier, presented Luther with copies of his writings laid out on a table and asked him if the books were his and whether he stood by their contents. Luther confirmed he was their author, but requested time to think about the answer to the second question. He prayed consulted friends, and gave his response the next day. At the end of his speech, Luther raised his arm in the traditional salute of a knight winning a bout. Eck informed Luther that he was acting like a heretic. Luther refused to recant his writings. He is sometimes also quoted as saying, Here I stand, I can do no other. Over the next five days, private conferences were held to determine Luther's fate. The Emperor presented the final draft of the Edict of Worms on the 25th of May, 1521, declaring Luther an outlaw, banning his literature, and requiring his arrest. We want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic. It also made it a crime for anyone in Germany to give Luther food or shelter. It permitted, though, anyone to kill Luther without legal consequence. Luther's disappearance during his return to Wittenberg was planned. Frederick III had him intercepted on his way home in the forest near Wittenberg by masked horsemen impersonating highway robbers. They escorted Luther to the security of Wartburg Castle at Eisenach. During his stay at Wartburg, which he referred to as My Patmos, a reference to John of Patmos. Another day, folks. We'll leave it for now. Luther translated the New Testament from Greek into German and poured out doctrinal and polemic writings. These included a renewed attack on the Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz, whom he shamed into halting the sale of indulgences in his episcopates, and a refutation of the arguments of Latimus, on which he expounded the principles of justification to Jacobus Latimus, an orthodox theologian from Louvain. In the summer of 1521, Luther widened his target from individual pieties like indulgences and pilgrimages to doctrines at the heart of the church practice. 
In On the Abrogation of the Private Mass, he condemned as idolatry the idea that the Mass is a sacrifice, asserting instead that it is a gift to be received with thanksgiving by the whole congregation. His essay on confession, whether the Pope has the power to require it, rejected compulsory confession and encouraged private confession and absolution, since every Christian is a confessor. In November, Luther wrote the judgment of Martin Luther on monastic vows. He assured monks and nuns that they could break their vows without sin, because vows were an illegitimate and vain attempt to win salvation. Do not get in the way of Martin Luther when he's on a roll, folks. Luther made his pronouncements from Wartburg in the context of rapid developments at Wittenberg, of which he was kept fully informed. Andreas Karlstadt, supported by the ex-Augustinian Gabriel Zwilling, embarked on a radical programme of reform which in June 1521 exceeded anything envisaged by Luther. The reforms provoked disturbances, including a revolt by Augustinian friars against their prior, the smashing of statues and images in churches, and the denunciation of the magistracy. After secretly visiting Wittenberg in early December 1521, Luther wrote a sincere admonition by Martin Luther to all Christians to guard against insurrection and rebellion. Wittenberg became even more volatile after Christmas, when a band of visionary zealots, the so-called Zwickau prophets, arrived, preaching revolutionary doctrines such as the equality of man, adult baptism, and Christ's imminent return. When the town council asked Luther to return, he decided it was his duty to act. Luther secretly returned to Wittenberg on the 6th of March, 1522. He wrote to the elector, During my absence, Satan has entered my sheepfold and committed ravages which I cannot repair by writing, but only by my personal presence and living word. For eight days in Lent, beginning on Invocavit Sunday, 9th of March, Luther preached eight sermons, which became known as the Invocavit Sermons. In these sermons, he hammered home the primacy of core Christian values such as love, patience, charity, and freedom, and reminded the citizens to trust God's word rather than violence to bring about necessary change. The effect of Luther's intervention was immediate. After the sixth sermon, the Wittenberg jurist Jerome Schuff wrote to the elector, Oh, what joy has Dr. Martin's return spread among us! His words, through divine mercy, are bringing back everyday misguided people into the way of the truth. Despite his victory at Wittenberg, Luther was unable to stifle radicalism further afield. Preachers such as Thomas Mützen and the Zwickau prophet Nicholas Storch found support amongst poorer townspeople and peasants between 1521 and 1525. There had been revolts by the peasantry on a much smaller scale since the 15th century. Luther's pamphlets against the church and the hierarchy, often worded with liberal phraseology, led many peasants to believe he would support an attack on the upper classes in general. Revolts broke out in Franconia, Schwabia and Thuringia in 1524, even drawing support from disaffected nobles, many of whom were in debt. Gaining momentum under the leadership of radicals such as Münzen in Thuringia and Hippler and Lotze in the southwest, the revolts turned into war. Luther sympathised with some of the peasants' grievances, as he showed in his response to the Twelve Articles in May 1525, but he reminded the aggrieved to obey the temporal authorities. Luther justified his opposition to the rebels on three grounds. First, in choosing violence over lawful submission to the secular government, they were ignoring Christ's counsel to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. St. Paul had written in his epistle to the Romans 3, 1-7 that all authorities are appointed by God, and therefore should not be resisted. This reference from the Bible forms a foundation for the doctrine known as the divine right of kings, or in the German case, the divine right of princes. Second, the violent actions of rebelling, robbing and plundering place the peasants outside the law of God and empire, so they deserved death in body and soul, if only as highwaymen and murderers. Lastly, 
Luther charged the rebels with blasphemy for calling themselves Christian brethren and committing their sinful acts under the banner of the gospel. Without Luther's backing for the uprising, many rebels laid down their weapons. Others felt betrayed. Their defeat by the Schwabian League at the Battle of Frankenhausen on the 15th of May 1525, followed by Münzer's execution, brought the revolutionary stage of the Reformation to a close. By 1526, Luther found himself increasingly occupied in organising a new church. His biblical ideal of congregations choosing their own ministers had proved unworkable. From 1525 to 1529, he established a supervisory church body, laid down a new form of worship service, and wrote a clear summary of the new faith in the form of two catechisms. To avoid confusing or upsetting the people, Luther avoided extreme change. He also did not wish to replace one controlling system with another. He concentrated on the church in the electorate of Saxony, acting only as an advisor to churches in new territories, many of which followed his Saxon model. In response to demands for a German liturgy, Luther wrote a German Mass, which he published in early 1526. Luther based his order on the Catholic service, but omitted everything that smacks of sacrifice, and the Mass became a celebration where everyone received the wine as well as the bread. He retained the elevation of the host and the chalice, while trappings such as mass vestments, altar and candles were made optional, allowing freedom of ceremony. Luther devised the catechism as a method of imparting the basics of Christianity to the congregations. In 1529, he wrote the Large Catechism, a manual for pastors and teachers, as well as a synopsis, the Small Catechism, to be memorised by the people. The catechisms provided easy understanding, instructional and devotional material on the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Luther incorporated questions and answers in the catechism so that the basics of the Christian faith could not just be learned by rote, the way monkeys do it, but understood. Luther's small catechism proved especially effective in helping parents teach their children. Likewise, the large catechism was effective for pastors. Luther had been suffering from ill health for years, though, including Meniere's disease, vertigo, fainting, tinnitus, and a cataract in one eye. From 1531 to 1546, his health deteriorated further. In 1536, he began to suffer from kidney and bladder stones, arthritis, and an ear infection which ruptured an eardrum. In December 1544, he began to feel the effects of angina. His poor physical health made him short-tempered and even harsher in his writings and comments. His last service was written at Eisleben, his birthplace, on the 15th of February 1546, three days before his death. It was entirely devoted to the obdurate Jews, whom it was a matter of great urgency to expel from all German territory. Ugh, can't escape the anti-Semitism. At 1am on the 18th of February 1546, he awoke with more chest pain and was warmed with hot towels. He thanked God for revealing his son to him in whom he had believed. An apoplectic stroke deprived him of his speech, and he died shortly afterwards at 2.45am on the 18th of February 1546 aged 62, in Eisleben, the city of his birth. He was buried in the Schlosskirche in Wittenberg, in front of the pulpit. The funeral was held by his friends Johannes Bugenhagen and Philip Melechthon. A year later, in 1546, troops of Luther's adversary, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, entered the town, but were ordered by Charles not to disturb the grave. Martin Luther, monk, theologian, revolutionary, reformationary, constipationary, and yes, that is a word, now, and I still will not explain it. Just look up the whole constipation thing. Martin Luther wanted to change practices within the Catholic Church, but ended up rendering it asunder. He thought he could fix it, yet in the end he started something in which he and the Church could not be together again. We can only imagine how hard it must have been for someone who had, once upon a time, joined the Catholic Church after a thunderstorm. 
but now he was responsible for starting a maelstrom which would soon engulf the whole continent of Europe in religious reform and war. But this is for another episode. Coming up, Schmalkaldic War, Eighty Years' War, Thirty Years' War, Calvinism, Priest of Westphalia, and, of course, King Henry VIII. And all in one episode. Maybe. So, for now, I would like to thank you all for listening. Remember, if you've enjoyed what you've listened to, give us the five-star review on whichever podcast platform you're using. Give us a follow. Give us a like. Give us a comment. Give some feedback. All of that will help. We have an Instagram page where you can find us at cogito underscore ergo underscore pod. So please come and give us a follow and send me a message if there's anything in particular you would like me to cover in future episodes. Also, you'll find us on YouTube. Just type in and search Cogito Ergo Pod. We'll probably be the first one that pops up. So for now, I'd like to thank you for listening, for being 